if you've got your booklet with you, today we're starting week two, which is reaching out together. And uh, so the message notes are on page 21. There's a blank page there for you to fill those in. Uh, so hopefully you brought a pen along to do that. And then on page 22 are our life group notes for this week. I don't know about you, but I found last week's DVD so challenging about what it means to truly love people, not just conditional love. And this week, the topic in our life groups is going to be meeting the needs of others. We then have got the devotionals from page uh, or day 8 to 15 is what this week's looking at. And I've also found those devotional notes exceptionally challenging as I've been reading through them. God just challenging me, uh, inviting me to love more deeply and more, more Christ-likely, if there is such a word. So we're on that journey together. One or two people have asked me about Rick Warren, and uh, we've used his DVDs this year as well as last year. And the reason people have asked the question is related to some controversy that's been around him. If you Googled uh, Rick Warren controversy, you could see some of those. One of those is an accusation that was made against him that uh, he uh, advocates merging the teachings of Islam and Christianity. I have hunted for Rick Warren saying anything like that and couldn't find it. Quite the opposite. I found an interview with him done by Christianity Today where he speaks about uh, some reports that were done on him that were totally fabricated, and he just calls it the lie that will never die. Uh, for those who are really interested in this kind of stuff, there's a, an interview done of Rick Warren by John Piper, who in terms of style are probably on opposite ends of the spectrum, yet both love God very deeply and have got very successful kind of international ministries and followings. And for an hour and 35, John Piper asked Rick Warren questions about doctrine. I haven't watched that whole video, but the bits I have watched are, are exceptionally inspiring and exceptionally challenging. So uh, I've never met Rick Warren personally, but all the fruit that we've seen from their church and in these series uh, have led us to feel that it would be just brilliant for us to have this input as well. I had, we've got, I think, around about 190 groups busy doing better together. And one of those groups, the story really, really um, touched me. A mom told me that her grade seven daughter, together with a buddy who's also in grade seven, approached Yvonne, who heads up our firehouse on Friday nights, which is from grade five through to seven. And they said to her, could they have permission to launch a better together group in one of their homes? And I think it happened on Tuesday night. And so this Tuesday, the last Tuesday night, this Better Together group started. They started with the DVD, and they, they figured that was just a little above them, and then went to the discussion questions. And the mom messaged me afterwards just to say how uh, overwhelmed she was at seeing these, these were primary school kids doing Better Together, gathering by two grade sevens, 12, 13-year-olds, saying we want to do, we want to be Better Together. So we celebrate all of those groups that are happening. And just to give you a roadmap, over the next five weeks, we're taking the, the kind of five core purposes that you and I have from the great commandment and the great commission, if, if those, those terms are new to you, those are two of the most important things that Jesus told his followers. I mentioned the great commandment a couple of weeks ago, but it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which refers to we, we were made for God's pleasure, so we, our purpose is to lift them up in worship, so that's coming near the end. And then it says love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second last week of Better Together. But for the next three weeks, we're going to look at three ideas that come from the Great Commission. And that is from Matthew chapter 28. And so that's going to be my starting point this morning. Matthew 28, verse 18 through to 20. And for those of you familiar with this verse, you'll remember that Jesus said that right near the end of his time here on earth, giving a command to his followers and by extension to every single one of us who follow Christ. And this is what he says to them. Therefore, Go. So if you've got pen and paper, you might not get through writing out the whole verse, and I'm going to ask you to just write down these underlined words, therefore go, therefore go. If you could just write those somewhere near the top of your page, if you're taking notes. So Jesus says to his followers, therefore go and make disciples, another word for disciples is followers, That's, it's slightly different to just converts, it's not just about belief, it's about living, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, that's all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What we did here this morning is not just a religious ritual, it's obedience to the command of Christ. And for those 
16, I think it was, odd people who got baptized this morning. Well done. We, we sang it in song, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's not just about being a follower, which is the top point, but it's about obeying everything, including baptism. And if you have not been through the waters of baptism by immersion, I'd like you to go and search the scriptures to see why it, it's commanded by Christ. It's not just an optional extra. I've heard people come up with all kinds of reasons why they are excluded from that line. I don't think any of it holds any water. If you look at what Christ said, he, in fact, this is so strong, he's telling his followers to baptize people. If I could uh, play this out, it's like, Graham, are you a follower of Christ? Yes, I am. Great, we are gonna baptize you. I'm gonna, although we're not gonna ever force anybody, but that's that kind of strength of baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them finally to obey everything I've commanded you. So within, that, within this text, we see three of our purposes, and the, the one we're going to tackle today is therefore go. Our purpose is that we were made for a mission. Every single one of us were designed for a mission. Following Christ isn't just about worship, not just about, if you like, singing or our connection this way. It's about a connection with other people that way. Our purpose, according to Matthew 28, is to share the good news which is what the word gospel actually means, to share the good news with other people, to reach out to others, if you like. And this includes neighbors and it includes nations. No ethnic group is excluded from our scope. He says, go into all the world, go to all nations and make disciples. Now, for some of us, we say, well, it's much easier to just go next door, but I wouldn't like to ever go out of the country, for example. Well, the option isn't given there. It's just going to all nations. But for other people, it's much more terrifying to go to neighbors than to go to foreign countries. Like I'd far rather speak to people that I'll never see again than people that I live next door to or that I work with. The reason we're doing the series better together is because we believe that the Bible shows us so clearly that none of our purposes, including being on mission, can be done alone. And every single thing that God tells us to do, we are better together in doing those things. Listen to how Paul words it in Philippians chapter one. He says, in, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Your partnership in the gospel. He says, part of the reason I, I think of you with joy is because we partnered together in sharing the good news, that's the word gospel, from the very first day. And so what we're gonna be doing today is using the first seven letters, that word partner, and using that as an acrostic for the seven points of how we are better together in reaching out to our neighbors and to nations, and in particular, how in our small groups, we get to share the gospel, we get to be on mission together, and why it's better together to do that. Throughout this series, you're going to make, hear us making a big deal of our life groups and of the six-week Better Together groups. That's not to exclude anybody, but it's for this reason. As we said last week, it's impossible to talk about one of the central themes of the Bible, the theme of love and the theme of community without being in community. It's impossible to read a textbook on love and say, okay, now, I now know all about it. I would go as far as say it's impossible to only read the Bible and then say, I know what community is all about. It's lived out by hanging out together with other people. So in our life groups, how do we partner together to share the good news with others? Well, first of all, the letter P. First point is, it's good to pray together, to talk to God. There's tremendous power in praying together, not just by myself, but with some others. Prayer is essentially talking to God. So we get to talk to God, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not sure what to pray. Sometimes I'm not even sure if I'm praying the right thing. Like God, I'm, your word says, let your will be done. I'm not exactly sure in this situation, but I, I'm bringing the best I've got. I'm talking to you. And an amazing thing is that when we talk to God, he hears us and somehow, and I don't pretend to understand how all of this works, somehow God acts in response to our prayers. Not always to give us as Dusty said earlier in our prayer meeting, not always to give us what we want, 
but to give us what we actually need. And when we start praying for other friends and for people who don't yet know Christ, he hears and he acts. Listen to this incredible verse in Matthew 18 where Jesus speaks about God's response when a group of people pray together. He says, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Just a little tisanakis here, uh, parentheses. I've heard some people use that verse to say, I don't need to be part of a local church because wherever I am interacting, if I'm at work and there's just two or three other believers, well, God's there as well. I don't think this verse has got anything to do with being part of a local church or actively involved in the church. Instead, this is saying Christ is present in a very special way where his community of believers get together and in particular when they pray. Two or three of you gather together or eight or 10 or 15 in a life group or in a family driving on the way to work. In my name, send requests heavenwards. He says, I'm with them and I'm listening and my father will answer. Now, second thing happens when we pray. It's not just that God hears and he acts, but actually our hearts change. And when we pray together, very often our eyes and our brain and our heart are sensitized to possible opportunities that we might not have seen before. So one of the suggestions I'd like to make, uh, if you haven't already done this in your small group previously, in your life group, or you've just started meeting, I think it's a good idea to have a list of people that are friends or family members of your group that we pray for together. And we might not pray for them every week. Uh, I've seen some groups do that before a series like Better Together. Well, they write a list of names and then everybody prays. And we say, okay, now what are we gonna do next? Are we gonna invite some people? And as invitations go out, a whole lot of people say no, but a whole lot of people say yes. But our eyes are sensitized as we pray together and we, we make a group prayer list. I'd like to ask you a question this morning. If you've got faith in Christ and you're actively connected, who's on your, if I could say, personal list of people that you pray for to come to faith in Christ? That's part of going. The first P, the first part is prayer, is that we talk to God about others. Occasionally on the way to school with my boys when I drop them off, we'll pray like that. I'll say, guys, why don't we each shoot a name out and then let's pray for somebody who's not following Christ that we know of, or somehow has got disconnected from his local church. And that's not in any way being critical or trying to forward judgment. No, it's actually out of care and out of love. And I'm astonished at these incredibly heartfelt prayers that my boys sometimes pray. Sometimes they don't, but often it is. Heartfelt prayers, talking to God about those around us. The second idea, second letter in the word partner, how we partner together is act on the nudges, act on the nudges. First of all, pray and then act on the nudges. I'll tell you where I got that word from. A couple of years back, a friend of ours, friends of ours, Wayne and Renee from Germany came and preached here. They're actually coming again later this year um, to be with us for a couple of days. Just out of interest, how many of you can remember that visit uh, when Wayne preached? You were around that day. So he started off his message with a video clip of ballroom dancing. And I thought, well, that's new. I've never seen a message start with a video clip of ballroom dancing. But his point was this, is that God wants to guide us. And in ballroom dancing, and they'd just been on some lessons, he says, the, the way that you guide isn't with loud shouting, but just with a little nudge on the back to let your partner know where you're going so that you avoid stepping on toes. And he said, he's often found that when God guides us, Sometimes it's with great big signs, but most often it's just with a gentle nudge. And this idea is such a powerful one is that the Holy Spirit wants to nudge us to be on mission, to nudge us to speak to others who may not yet understand his incredible love. There's a beautiful story in Acts of a man named Philip who understood this idea following the nudges of God. And he was walking along a road one day and well, God had directed him to that road and while he was walking along the road, this, this is what Acts 8 says. It says, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, for some people, you say, well, that just, I put that verse on the slides. 
Oh, there we go. Thank you. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Some people, they read, well, the Holy Spirit's never told me. I've never heard any loud voice. And I'm not sure that this was a, an out clear voice uh, as an audible voice. But somehow Philip followed the nudge and he felt God say, go to that chariot. Now, in those days, it was mostly people walking long roads and wealthy people would have had chariots on occasion, but th they wouldn't have been galloping at high speed all the way on their journey, just going along at a, maybe a trot or a horse walk. And so Philip jogs up next to this chariot. An amazing thing he hears is that the guy in the chariot is reading aloud from the book of Isaiah. He's reading the Bible, but he's reading it out loud. So Philip pops his head around and says, uh, do you understand what you're reading? How many of you think that took a little bit of courage just to ask that question? Just to go up to a stranger in his chariot, happened to be reading the Bible. And the end of the story, this is incredible, is this guy invites him onto the chariot and it turns out that he is a high-ranking government official from a foreign country in the area of where modern-day Ethiopia is. And in fact, he was in charge of the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia if you like, in modern day language, he was their minister of finance to the best of my understanding. And Philip had no idea when walking along that road how the day would go for him. And he just followed a nudge that said, go and talk to that guy. And that man, that very day, stopped his chariot and got baptized. He said, now that I understand properly, I'm gonna follow Christ. Many Bible commentators believe that the gospel first came to Africa because of this minister of finance this chief official in the Ethiopian government. And it wouldn't have happened that day if it hadn't been for Philip following a nudge. You see, when we feel these nudges, these moments saying, go and talk to that person or go and message that person or make a phone call or connect, we've got no idea the way that will lead. All of it requires courage like it required for Philip. One of a, in a life group meeting that I was in at the end of, just about every life group meeting, um, we like to stop for a time of prayer. Pray for people outside of the group or pray for needs that are in our group. And one day, one of the groups we led previously, one of the guys in the group said, I'd love to ask for prayer for one of my clients. I chatted on the phone with him today and, and he's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I don't know where he stands with faith in God, but he's going through a really tough time. And so we prayed for this man. The next morning, as my friend got out of the shower, he felt God nudge him, just this gentle, he didn't know how to explain it, just a gentle nudge of make a phone call, make an appointment to see this client and talk to him about faith. He, he told me he was terrified because he didn't feel he had any of the answers because he was pretty new to faith himself. And as he picked up his phone, there was a, a WhatsApp message from that client saying, I need to talk to you about such and such. It was a business related matter. So that gave him some confidence and he picked up the phone, phoned the guy back and said, could we have coffee? And he didn't do it at his office because he said his boardroom was totally, had, uh, was glass enclosed. So they went out to a coffee shop and said, I don't know how to even say this or begin, but I have had you so much in my mind and I just, I've come to faith in Christ and began to tell some of his story and ask the guy, where do you stand with all of this? And the client got quite, uh, this friend of his got quite sober and said, uh, I've never had any faith of any sort in my whole life. But since I've got this cancer diagnosis, I've been thinking about it and I can't stop thinking about what lies beyond. And through a series of events, not that same morning at coffee, but through a series of events, this man who lived his entire life into his mid fifties with no faith in Christ, came to know Christ because of a little nudge that happened after some prayer in a group and a man who courageously picked up the phone and said, I'm willing to have a copy, even if I don't know what lies ahead with this conversation, that man will be with us for all eternity because of a guy following a nudge and strangely enough was all triggered in a life group time of prayer and him following up in obedience, a nudge of the Holy Spirit. The third one, the R, how do we partner together to be on mission? Is we need to remember the why. Remember the why. Remind each other about the why. This is why groups are so powerful because as individuals, our faith can get quite small. And what I mean by that is it gets quite focused on just my world. 
And when I'm with a group, I realize, boy, there's a, there's a lot beyond me. There's a lot more that God's wanting to do than just bless me and my family. And when it comes to this idea of remembering the why, <laughs> it's just a, a comment I'd like to make here. If people in our groups are doing number one, praying, and are doing number two, acting on the nudges, what could happen in our groups? It's not a trick question, but I'll shoot you the answer I've got in my head, is people might actually come. Okay, I extend invitations, I'm praying, I'm following nudges, people might actually join the group. So what then can happen, particularly in groups that are really, really close and tight and loving, is some new people can join the group and people in the group say, Phew, I'm not sure I really wanted God to answer all of those prayers. I'm not sure that I want our group dynamic to change because it always changes when people get added into the group. Imagine if God answered our prayers. I'm just um, speaking here uh, along this idea. Imagine if God answered our prayers. We pray, we say, God, please would you add many people to our group that they would come to faith in you. Imagine if you answered that. Imagine if all 190 groups, there was some answer to that prayer. Well, what would have to happen then? A group that becomes huge, well, that's difficult to have community in. Well, we might need to start some new groups. And there might be people in our group that might get, if I could say, clump together and start a new group. And that starting and that change of dynamic creates its own kind of difficulty. It, it's tricky because those are friends we saw every week and now we're not seeing them again. But here's the deal. If we go back to reminding ourselves of the why, it helps us process some of the awkwardness that comes in doing life together and in God answering our prayers. And when I say remember the why, there's two things that jump to my mind. Is first of all, we remember the why by, with gratitude. With gratitude. The gospel, if you like, in a nutshell, the good news is this, is that God created every single human being on this planet and he loves every single person. God has never created a person that he doesn't love. We carry our own stuff inside of our hearts towards others, but God loves everybody. He created us for a relationship together with him and to live a life of purpose with him and to be with him for all eternity. The bad news, and there's gotta be bad news if the good news is gonna be really good. The bad news is that all of us are naturally rebels against God. And what I mean by that is we naturally do our own thing. We are naturally selfish. We naturally live how we want to live. And we cannot bridge the gap between us and God. No matter how hard we try, no matter how many good things we do, none of that can wipe out the fact that we are rebels against this divine God, King, ruler, and judge. This is the good news, is that God, knowing what a mess every human being is in, didn't just from heaven say, well, I'm just going to obliterate everybody, sent his son as a human being to live on this earth. And when people ask, God, how much do you love me? He stretches out his hands and he says this much. And the hands of the creator who comes to earth as a human being, incarnate is the big word for it, dies on the cross. Somehow in his incredible rich love, God puts the punishment for sin on him so that the sinner, me, can have forgiveness. And the separation from God that I deserve goes to Christ. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's not a question of what's God's reason behind it, but it's a cry of anguish. And the reason is this, is because God wanted to adopt me and you into his family. And once adopted into his family, Live a life of purpose that goes far beyond just the small, meaningless, selfish God rebellion that lives naturally within my heart and promises me an eternity together with him, together with every other person that's been adopted into his family. That essentially is the good news. I can't imagine any news better than that. And out of gratitude for what he has done, why would no one have let other people in on the good news? My my boy reminded me of a story that he had heard and went and looked it up. It was a story of a penniless boy who in the famine, I think it was an island, climbed on as a stowaway onto a boat that was headed for the US in about the 1850s. And the ship struck an iceberg 
It didn't sink very quickly, so everybody was able to get into the lifeboats. And the boy, who, from his hiding place, realized the ship had stopped sailing, came out on deck just in time to see the captain about to climb into the very last seat on the lifeboat. The captain turning around figured out what had happened, that the stowaway hadn't paid for his passage. Uh, was, there wasn't a seat left for him. And so he gave the boy his seat on the lifeboat. And as he pushed the lifeboat off, the captain stood there on the deck and said to the boy, never forget what has been done for you. And this boy carried this picture for the rest of his life of going away from the boat, seeing the captain standing on the ship and saying to him, never forget what's been done for you. He became a very successful, very successful businessman in the new world in America. Whenever anybody asked him of his story, he always went back to the story of the captain. And now whenever he had got discouraged, whenever he wanted to back down from doing what he knew to be doing, he remembered the words of the captain saying to him, never forget what's been done for you. And this is the why. Remind ourselves of the why. is because the captain of the entire world gave up his life, his place, so that you and I could live with him forever. Paul says it like this. He says, for Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. We never forget what he's done. And it compels us to live a life that's bigger than just me, my, and I. And the second thing we, the why we need to remember is that we've got the greatest news in the world to share. I've touched on that already. And just for those adding up the numbers of letters coming, put most of my points and most of my time into the first three. Coming to the rest. But this is the greatest news in the world. My brother was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma last year. The second part of that didn't mean too much to me until when I started to read up, and this was in June. I've, I've shared some of the story before. He uh, got a brain tumor. And when you're in stage four, that essentially is incurable. So what the doctor said is there's no current treatment on the market that can cure you. Essentially, he had a death sentence handed to him. But they said there is a possible hope. There's a drug trial that you could get onto, a new drug that seems to be doing amazing things for melanoma. He's made it onto that trial. But let me tell you the story of another person on that trial. Many of you will remember Peter Howard Brown preached here. He had a terrible stroke, but after the stroke, his wife, Jan, was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma. Inexplicably. And two years ago, 18 months ago, Jan gets onto this trial. But before she gets onto the trial, the doctor says to her, you might as well go home and say your goodbyes to your family. You've only got a few months left to live. So that's what she walks out of the doctor's rooms, out of the oncologist's rooms with, with that hanging over her head. He has about this new trial, and 18 months later, this year in January, is the first patient in South Africa to be declared absolutely cancer-free from this new drug. I don't know how the whole drug works. I'm just telling you the little bit I know. So, but, but I can, if you have questions, put you in touch with the oncologist. What do you think Jan's response is when she finds out that there's this cure for an absolute what's the word, a, a death sentence disease. Boy, anybody within her circle that she knows, she's telling. And that's how my brother ended up on the drug trial. Now, even if you've got cured from cancer, you will die in the future. This is a great message of hope and encouragement for anybody here. Because every single one of us has a terminal disease called life physical life. It comes to an end one day. But if you believe Christ and you know that he has rescued you, you know that you found a cure that's far beyond any cure for HIV AIDS, any cure for cancer. It's the greatest news in the world to share. Why wouldn't you want to say something to somebody somehow? And if you say it wrong the first time, say it better the second time and figure out a way of helping people. The T is for tell your story. See, a lot of the reasons that people don't feel that they can talk to friends, family members, neighbors about Christ is because they feel, I don't have enough 
of the theological answers for the tough questions. There's some tough questions and there's some questions that I don't know that we'll ever know the full answer for in this life. But there's one thing that you and I have got that nobody else has got, and that's our own story. And here's a really cool thing. The way God wired us, He wired us as story junkies. We are designed with story DNA, story blood. We pay money to watch made up stories with people acting somebody that they're not, but it makes a story that touches our heart. And we're like, oh, I'm inspired to live a better life. Or I'm not inspired at all, whatever the made up story is. We watch television programs of story. And you know how God introduces himself to us in the Bible? It's through a story. It's in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and void. He tells the story and the theology, if you like, is weaved into the story. But every single human being is designed to enjoy story. And you and I have got a story that we can find what we need in that story to share in different situations, hopefully. Now, I heard, I had a little crisis uh, probably in my early 20s, where I didn't think my story was cool enough. Because it went something like this. My parents became Christians before I was born. The very worst bottle that I was on was a milk bottle. And I came off that when I was about three or four, or two or three, I can't remember, one or two. I was raised in a Christian home, and I followed Christ to the best of my ability from when I was a child up till now with bumps along the way. But I never ever... I never deviated completely from faith in him. I had bumps, but never deviated from faith. And then I hear other people share amazing stories of, they were, I would say, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum of grace. So I remember thinking one day, God, I don't think I've got a story that's good enough to share. Imagine if I had a cool story like so-and-so's story. And I felt God challenged me with this, is every single person's story of grace is an amazing story. And there's some people that I rescued in this way, and there's other people I rescued in that way, and every single person has a story to tell. My story is going to impact some people in some ways, and your story impacts other people in other ways. But it's not just a story of how we came to faith, it's a story of what God's doing through us and with us now. And that's a story no one can replicate because it's our story. We're going to tell our stories. It's also worth listening to other people's stories and asking some questions. Please, 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 let's not become people who are just offloading. We do 70, 80% of the talking the whole time. I think our stories are even more powerful if we've done 80% of the listening and then 20% of storytelling. The N stands for nurture friendships. Nurture friendships. You, listening to my previous points, you might think what I'm driving at is just finding random people going and speaking to them. And that's a good idea. But chances are some of the greatest impact we could have on others is just through nurtured friendships that go over years. And there's two extremes that come into many Christ followers' hearts. And the one extreme is the extreme of imitation. So when being around people who don't share your value system and who don't follow Christ, we say, well, the best way to reach them is to become exactly like them. I want, to know, I want them to know that I'm no different in any way. The Bible actually has a problem with that. Because if, if I've got God who is so incredibly big and so incredibly loving and so incredibly holy in me, it is going to provide some differences. But one thing is sure is I don't ever want to be judgmental. So I think it's possible to live within the yellow lines that God's drawn for me, but not to ever judge somebody else's choices. We can love and hang together. Do you know that Jesus was accused of, of hanging out with the wrong crowd? Some of the very religious people said to him, or said to his followers, how come Jesus hangs out with those guys, the real party animals? I don't think that's because Jesus was the party animal, but because he wanted to reach them. And they loved being around him, but I don't think it's because he was imitating them. It's because he was non-judgmental, loving, and kind. There's another extreme, though. If the one is imitation of I want to, I, would, I don't want to be any different from anybody else, there's another extreme that can happen is we can get into isolation. Like, it, in time, your friends may become Christ followers or you, you start connecting with people who love Christ and you share a value system. 
And it's possible that you can come to a point where you think, I don't have any true friendships that are of people who don't yet know Christ. Well, my question or challenge this morning is, why not go out and make some of those friends? And when other people in your group have got friendships like that, are you hearing about them? You're praying for them? Imagine if those people visit the group. What do you think they're hoping for the rest of us in the group to do? It's to be nice, to be kind, to ask some questions, to be careful in how we talk. You see, the reason I'm saying this is because we never know how God will use us. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And who knows, but I might have a conversation, you might have a coffee, you've, somebody else does that, and they end up coming to faith in Christ through something else. And in heaven, we all get to say, well, I planted a seed, you watered, you did something else, but God ultimately made it all grow. Number E, or letter E, I'm coming in for a landing, is for expect God to act. Expect God to act. I don't know how this works, but somehow God seems to be working more through those who have got higher expectation than through those who have no expectation. In the 19th century, one of the most famous preachers was a guy named Charles Spurgeon. He had the biggest church in the world, as far as I know. Often would preach without any microphones up to 10,000 people on a Sunday. And he'd often speak to people about Christ, and people came to, many people came to faith through Spurgeon's life. And one day, a young man came to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I don't understand it. Whenever you talk to people about the Lord, they always tend to open up their lives. They tend to accept Christ. When I talk to the people about God, nobody's interested. Nobody comes to Christ. What's wrong? Do you know what Spurgeon answered him? He said to him, young man, you don't expect people to come to Christ every time you talk about him, do you? He said, no, of course not. So Spurgeon said, that's your problem. Could preach a whole nother message on how God works through faith. But suffice to say for today, let's expect God to use our lives and our groups to reach out. And then the final point R is let's rejoice. I, I try to find another word that started with R for this, but the best I could come up with was celebrate somewhere in the middle there, and that just didn't wasn't working. So I'm using a, a beautiful word from the Bible of rejoice. Let's rejoice with each act of courage. What do I mean by that? We speak about how our groups can share the message of Christ better together. Every now and then, I've seen in groups somebody come in and we'll pray for a list. And we'll, the whole group goes out and starts extending invites, including people who have never invited anybody in their lives to come to a church event or to an Alpha course or to a church-wide campaign. And as we meet, as the couple of weeks leading up to it go on, we meet and somebody will say, I tried inviting this person and that person, and I got a no. And obviously, they said that that person said no. Their friend said no. But you know what? Just the invitation is a huge act of courage. And we get to celebrate every act of courage, every act of kindness, phone calls that are made, things that went well, as well as things that go poorly. The things that go well are the much easier stories to tell. I met with this guy. That happened, that happened, that happened. He became a Christ follower. It was the Ethiopian guy, da 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 Philip goes, nice story to tell. But I reckon there's a whole lot more stories that every single person of faith has got who's been effective like this, of people who said no, who got really angry and got really upset, or didn't want to talk about it, left it, said no thank you forever. And if we, because of that reason, just give up, well, we've hung on to the best news. We spoke about the why earlier. But as a group, in our, all of our groups, it's possible to encourage one another to celebrate, just to high five every small act of courage, partner together, because God's actually doing the work to see people reached for Christ. Could you stand together with me, please?